want to say welcome to those who are joining us on the internet. And uh, it's good to know that uh, the numbers aren't dependent on what's here. We stretch out the walls of our tents, as Isaiah would put it, and uh, be able to fellowship with people around the world. So welcome uh, as uh, you join us here. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity we have to be able to share around the world the wonder of your word. We pray that we will have that sense that as we meditate on your word, you are indeed revealing great things of yourself. But we would know you more than anything else. And so we pray this in your name's sake. Amen. 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 I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 4 and from verse 1 to verse 9. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. In this way, dear friends, I plead with you, dear. And I plead with Sinti to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put, into, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. May the Lord add his blessing as we come to meditate on his word today. Do you know, I love Philippians. I don't know about you, but I love Philippians. And I love this, these bits where it speaks about rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And just to make sure we don't forget and again I say, rejoice. Just an emphasis there on that rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Great to be able to rejoice in the Lord, to praise his name, to be able to focus on the one who is worthy of all the glory and all the praise and all the honour. We will praise him and him alone. We will praise him and him alone. Charles Spurgeon once said, uh, <clears throat> to visit many good books uh, is good, but live in the Bible. Visit many good books, but live in the Bible. You know, we can go and we can look at this book and that book and the other book, and, and they may all have wonderful points, but what is far better isn't just to visit those books, but to live in the Bible. And you notice this isn't about visiting the Bible, it's living in the Bible, living in God's Word, and to live in God's Word, knowing here is what my God, our God, has to say for us. The way He wants to lift us up, to re reveal to us uh, the wonderful things that He has for us. In this passage, in the book of books, in this passage, we see that theme that's running through. Rejoice, be at peace, and think excellently. 
Rejoice, be at peace, and think excellently. And as Paul will write these words, uh, he, he first of all is saying, pursuing divine joy. Pursuing divine joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And when Paul is writing these things, you know, he's saying, look, you know, can talk about joy, you can talk about your happiness and all those kind of things, but what is crucial is, where does your joy come from? And as we speak about this joy of the Lord, we need to remember that it is the gift of God. No wonder he's saying, not just rejoice, but rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And to rejoice in the Lord always. So we need to understand the source of the joy that makes a difference. Do you know when Paul is writing this, this letter to the Philippians, uh, what a wonderful place it was for him to rejoice, wasn't it? In prison. No? Well, that's where he was. He was in prison. And there he was, imprisoned. Soldiers were guarding him. He no doubt would have had chains on his hands, perhaps. And there he is, writing these words. Rejoice! And I wonder how many of us, if we were in prison, how many of us would be saying, wow, I just want to be so joyful. I want to rejoice here. And probably most of us would say, uh-uh, that's not for me. I, I, I don't feel like rejoicing. It just doesn't make sense for me. I don't feel like rejoicing. I don't feel like rejoicing. You ever had those moments? I don't feel like rejoicing. I remember somebody saying to me once, uh, we had a hymn called, it wasn't here, it was somewhere else, and some, we had this hymn, Oh happy day, uh, fixed by choice, on thee my saviour and my God. Do you know the hymn? Yeah, we've had it. <laughs> and, yeah. Anyway, we had this hymn, Oh happy day, uh, fixed by choice, on thee, my Saviour, and my God. And this lady says to me, well, I wish you hadn't chosen that hymn because I don't feel like being happy today. And uh, it just isn't for me. Uh, what, this isn't a happy day for me. And what the lady hadn't grasped is that that hymn was speaking about a happy day, not because of our circumstances, but a happy day because of what God has for us. It's a happy day because Jesus took my sin away. It's a happy day because Jesus gave his life for us on the cross of Calvary. It's a happy day when we come to that point of trust in Jesus as our Saviour and our Lord. Oh, happy day. Now fix my choice on thee, my Saviour and my God. That puts things in a different perspective, doesn't it? Because we may have... Um, had all kinds of things that have happened to us. We may fall as we go down the road, it happens, doesn't it? We may fall as we go down the road, we feel the pain of it all. And yet in the midst of the pain of it all, for us to be able to say, well, I'm not so happy about my, uh, whatever I've done to my body in the fall, but I am rejoicing because I know that whatever the circumstances, my God is walking through all with me. And he is the God who promises to be with us in all circumstances. And when we see things in that kind of light, what a difference, isn't it? What a difference. And we can say, I'm praising the Lord. I am joyful in the Lord. Not because of my circumstances, but because whatever the circumstances, my Lord is here, he's in control, I'm trusting him. We need to understand the source of our joy is our Lord, our God. We're pursuing a divine joy that isn't dependent on our circumstances. And as we pursue a joy such as that, we have to recognize the role of faith. The role of faith. Paul writes, Paul writes here, do not be anxious about anything, 
But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Do not be anxious. And yet there are times we have concerns. But not to the extent of anxiety. Because we come to that point of saying, the things that I'm going through, the things that I'm experiencing, I am trusting my Lord. I am trusting my God. I am trusting Him every step of the way. And it's in that trust, it's in that faith, we can discover the joy irrespective, irrespective of what we're going through. It's just dawning on me. Look at those words on the text we have for this year. Different, a different part of the Bible. But what is it saying? Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. We have a joy. We can know that joy in our hope we've got in Jesus. We can know it as we are patiently working our way through affliction, as we faithfully are praying and talking with the Lord who can bring us through it all. Faith. And the importance of prayer. Talking. Talking with the commander-in-chief. Talking with our Lord. Talking with our garden. Sharing everything that's on our heart with him. With him. And to be obedient unto the one we are trusting every step of the way. Every step of the way. I was reading recently about somebody who had a, they had what they called a worry box. And what they used to do was they, well there was something they were worrying about and they would write it on a bit of paper and they would put whatever it was into this box close the box, and then carry on whatever they were doing in their life. And they left it there. They knew it could be dealt with sometime, but they didn't need to worry about it. It was in the box. It was in the worry box. And sometimes they might come back, and they would look through it and think, oh, hang on a minute. I was worried about that, but God took care of it. I don't need to worry about it. I leave it in the worry box. I leave it in the worry box. But how much better to place it all into the hands of God. To know he is more than able to meet our every need. Our every need. There was a 92-year-old Christian lady. And uh, always, people used to admire her. She was, legally she was blind. She could see a bit, but... Uh, she was legally, she was blind. But Emily admired her because she was a lady who always was spick and span, her, her neatly dressed, her hair was just as it should be. And people thought, wow, isn't she wonderful why she can do that? And one day after her husband had died, she was admitted into a, a nursing home. And the, um, the member of staff told her about the room that she was being given and uh, talked about all the different things that were in different places, uh, the, the bed and the chest of drawers and, uh, and the wonderful mirror that was on the, 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 uh, the wall and the ornaments that were there. And uh, the lady listened and she says, uh, it's lovely, isn't it? It's lovely. And the member of staff said to her, Hang on, what do you mean it's lovely? You can't see. How do you know it's lovely? Ah, she says. But being able to appreciate something isn't about what you see with your eyes. It depends on how my mind is arranged. I've heard your description. My mind has been arranged. It's all sorted out in my mind. I can visualize it in my mind. I don't need to worry about what it looks like. I know what it is. I trust in it. I'm trusting in it. 
pursue divine joy. But secondly, Paul is speaking about promoting peace in the congregation. Promoting peace in the congregation. And, and when we read through some of the earlier verses, quite clearly, there was some kind of strife that was going on here. Remember those earlier verses? I plead with Judea, and I plead with Sinti to be of the same mind in the Lord Jesus. Be of the same mind. Now, I don't know, I, I, I'm quite sure you're aware, I've never met uh, Judea, I've never met Sinti, but I do know that it must have been quite a thought for them to know these words our words were put in a letter and sent to Philippi, and 2,000 years later, we are still reading these words. Clearly, they had some contention. There was division in the ranks. And we might say, well, yeah, it's painful when we see division within a house of God. It shouldn't be. There is a pain. It's, it's a, and yet, you know, the reality is that it's a miracle when we see a gathering of people even in a church who are all of the same mind. It's a miracle. Why? Because if, if you're choosing your friends, what are you, what are you, what are you looking for? You're looking for things that you've got in common. Maybe it's your hobbies. Maybe it's your work experience. Maybe it's your cultural background. All kinds of things that you've got in common. And you know, the average church, they don't all have the same work experience. They don't all have the same kind of hobbies. And so in theory, there shouldn't be a unity. There shouldn't be a unity. And when a division comes, it comes because that's how we are, humanly speaking. That's coming naturally, part of our human life. So there is that division. What it is that brings us together is our oneness in Christ. And when we focus upon Jesus, those divisions will go. Those divisions will go. And I've not had the experiences that you've had. You've not had the experiences I've had. They are my experiences, they are your experiences. There's a division perhaps here. But what brings us together for all of that is Jesus. Jesus. That sweetest name that we could ever know. Jesus. Jesus. You see, there's a divine alternative. For all the reasons that divide us, there is a divine alternative. Paul says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's the peace of God. It's a peace that passes all human understanding. Because, humanly speaking, we shouldn't be at peace. But divine speaking, yeah, it's going to happen. Divinely speaking, it will happen. That divine alternative. It's available for us. Whatever may be our experiences of life, there comes a point when we need to focus on something different. We need to focus on something better. We need to focus on the things of our Lord. And in that oneness we can know there, what a difference. Paul is trying in this letter to promote that peace in a congregation that had division. It wasn't that they were unspiritual, because uh, Paul speaks about the great things that they have done. So it wasn't that they were unspiritual, but even in amongst the spiritual people, there comes that moment when something else clouds our mind. And we think about ourselves, when we should be focusing upon our Lord. Hard it may be, but it's what it must be. It's what it must be. Look to the divine alternative and to know that peace of God 
that be surpasses all human understanding. And to know that as we have that peace, here is our defense that we have in Christ Jesus. Defense that we have in Christ Jesus. In that seventh verse, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That word guard is it's a military term. And so if you can visualize this, it's a term that's referring to a soldier with a weapon who's pacing outside the entrance and the exit into the place where, the, where he's guarding. He's there to ensure that nobody goes in or out. And it's that kind of image that we have. Jesus is the one who will guard us. Guard us. As we are sensing and knowing the peace of God. In the midst of that, this will guard our hearts, our minds, in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. But thirdly, thirdly, let us put into practice a more excellent way. Let us put into practice a more excellent way. Come on then, you uh, dear, and uh, Siti. Uh, there are things that you feel are important in your life. There's a more excellent way than that. And as we look at the things that are in our lives too, there is a more excellent way than that. To walk within the excellent way. To walk within the things of our Lord and our God. To walk within all of that. To consider the best that could ever be. Uh, the best that could ever be. Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Do you know, I love the way that Paul puts that. You know, Paul is clearly aware that he wasn't perfect. Is there anyone here that is perfect? No, I didn't think there would be. Well, Paul is evidently aware he's not perfect. And so he's qualifying everything. He isn't just saying, follow my example, because he knows there are times when he was wrong. There are times when he didn't do what he should do. But he's saying, I want you to follow the example with that qualification. Whatever is noble, you can follow that. Whatever is right, you can follow that. Whatever is pure, you can cut, you can follow that. Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, that's the things that you can follow. Look, see the examples of that nature and follow. Anything that's excellent, follow. Anything that is praiseworthy, follow. Nothing else matters. And the things in my life that are part of a division within our company are, are not important. What is important is that we are walking in the footsteps of our Lord and our Saviour, our God. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Mm -hmm. Consider the best. And why shouldn't we? Who wants anything less than the best? Consider the best and create this as a reality. A reality of today. Can't be done. It's impossible. Well, yes, it can be. It can be. When we're looking at things in that spiritual sense, when we're looking at things and saying, this is what my Lord wants, then yes, it can. It can. To say, oh, I, I, I'm only human, I'll make mistakes. Well, yes, we are human. We will make mistakes. But we learn from it. 
and we move on from it and resolve within it that we will do what God wants for our lives. And in his strength, in his might, yes, it will be happening. It will be happening. Okay, consider the best and create this as a reality for today. And as we put it into practice, we need to complete this. And as we complete it, we need to discover the peace of God. The peace of God that passes all human understanding. Mm -hmm. To know that peace in our lives. To know it's a peace for us. To know it's a peace for us because he has given it to us. Our Lord has given it to us. Our Lord has given it to us and wants us to keep it within our lives. If we might move forward that much the better. That much the better. Charles Wesley once wrote a hymn, well he wrote a lot of hymns, thousands of hymns to be honest. Um, and one of his hymns, he wrote these words, I rest beneath the shame, I rest beneath the almighty shame, my griefs expire, my troubles cease. Thou Lord on whom my soul is stayed will keep me still in perfect peace. In perfect peace. And we know that peace in its perfection, that perfect peace. We know it when we know it in our Lord, our God. And we know it. And we know it as we begin uh, our life in trusting Jesus as Saviour and as Lord. And we know it as we continue in that Christian walk of our lives. And we know it as we day by day say, Lord, this is another day. And it's another day I give to you, Lord. Holy, completely. This day is yours. Mm -hmm. I am yours. And we look unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. Let's spend a few moments now in prayer. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, Father, we are conscious of words of the hymn writer who said, Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. And it's going to happen. When we know Jesus is the Savior, we have a confidence in that. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the King. But throughout this life, between now and the time in which we move beyond the grave and into eternity, may we be people who know what it is to rejoice wherever the circumstances who know what it is to be at peace, irrespective of our situation, and are willing to think excellently in the things of yourself. Lord, let it be true. May it be us, as our lives are lived wholly, completely, in your name, for your sake. And so we pray this in your name's sake. Amen. Thank you to those who have been with us on the internet and uh, we look forward to you one day perhaps being able to join with us here. Thank you.